One of the most famous lawmen in American history, the story of Wyatt Earp has endured for over a century. He's inspired movies, songs, and countless touristy reenactments. But who was the man behind the myth? Was he really as great as the stories make him seem? Let's take a look at the things you may not know about Wyatt Earp. After a Midwestern childhood, he headed to California by wagon train as a teen. Wyatt Barry Stapp Earp was born in Monmouth, Illinois, on March 19, 1848, and named for his father's commander in the Mexican-American War. His upbringing was colored by the varied occupations of his father, Nicholas Earp, who served as a farmer, a justice of the peace, and even dabbled in bootlegging at times. The family's life was marked by mobility, with Wyatt spending his childhood years in both Illinois and Iowa, where he likely absorbed the rugged spirit of the frontier. The outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861 ignited a restless spirit within the young Earp. Eager to join the Union Army, he attempted to enlist, but his father intervened and brought him back home. Undeterred, Wyatt's desire for adventure continued to simmer. In 1864, seizing an opportunity for a fresh start, the Earp family embarked on a journey westward, setting out on a perilous wagon train trek. Their westward journey was fraught with challenges typical of the era. They encountered the constant threat of Indian raids, and it was during this time that Wyatt allegedly witnessed his first gunfight. By the close of 1864, the Earps arrived in San Bernardino, California, a bustling hub in the midst of rapid development. Here, Wyatt found himself laboring alongside his father on their new farm contributing to the toil of building a homestead in the rugged landscape of the West. However, as the region boomed with opportunity, Wyatt sought different paths for himself. He soon transitioned to hauling freight and laboring in the bustling railroad camps that dotted the expanding frontier. He was a lawman in the wickedest little city in the West. By 1870, Earp landed his first job in law enforcement as the town constable in Lamar, Missouri, where his family had resettled. However, his tenure in this role was short-lived, as he departed in 1871 amidst allegations of mishandling public funds. That same year, he found himself entangled in legal trouble when he was arrested for horse theft in Indian Territory, present-day Oklahoma, although the case never made it to trial. In 1872, Earp found himself residing in Peoria, Illinois, where he took up employment as an enforcer in a brothel. His subsequent endeavors led him to a stint as a buffalo hunter before relocating to Wichita, Kansas in 1874. Wichita, known as a bustling hub for cattle shipping, became the backdrop for Earp's next career move when he secured a position as a policeman in 1875. However, his time in Wichita was marked by controversy when he was involved in a violent altercation, leading to his departure the following year. Earp then transitioned into the role of assistant marshal in Dodge City, Kansas, renowned as the wickedest little city in the West due to its lawless reputation amidst the booming cattle trade. Over the ensuing years, Earp divided his time between law enforcement duties in Dodge City during the cattle trading season and indulging in his penchant for gambling as a professional gambler in Texas and New Mexico during the off-season. Earp met Doc Holliday on the gambling circuit. Earp crossed paths with fellow gambler John Henry Doc Holliday during their time in Texas in 1878. Holliday, originally from Georgia and born in 1851, had pursued dentistry studies in Philadelphia. However, his life took a turn when he was diagnosed with tuberculosis in 1872, prompting doctors to advise him to seek a drier climate. Consequently, he relocated to Dallas in 1873 and initially partnered with another dentist. Yet Holiday's focus soon shifted from dental work to indulging in drinking and gambling. As Earp and Holiday frequented the Texas gambling scene in the late 1870s, they formed a friendship. Doc later became involved in the infamous gunfight at the O.K. Corral in 1881. Tragically, six years down the line, 
Holiday succumbed to tuberculosis at the age of 36 in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Revenge that never happened. One of the most memorable incidents during Wyatt Earp's tenure in Dodge City occurred in October of 1878. At that time, Earp, along with Sheriff Bat Masterson, Marshal Charles Bassett, Bill Tillman, and Deputy Duffy, embarked on a mission to apprehend James Spike Kennedy. Kennedy was sought after for the murder of beloved singer and entertainer Dora Hahn in Dodge City. After an ambush near Mead City, orchestrated by the posse, Bat Masterson managed to wound Kennedy in the shoulder, leading to his arrest. However, Kennedy was later released due to a lack of substantial evidence against him. Fast forward two years later, an intriguing turn of events unfolded. The Caldwell Commercial Newspaper, based in Caldwell, Kansas, published a startling account suggesting that Kennedy had perpetrated the shooting of Wyatt Earp in Colorado. According to the report, Wyatt Earp, once a policeman in Wichita but more recently a resident of Dodge City, met his demise in Sand Creek, Colorado, at the hands of James Kennedy from Texas. The article further detailed that Earp had previously wounded Kennedy in the shoulder in a prior encounter. Yet during their confrontation at Sand Creek, both individuals drew their revolvers, culminating in Kennedy fatally shooting Earp without hesitation. The erroneous article contained two significant inaccuracies. Firstly, it was Bat Masterson who had wounded Kennedy in the shoulder, not Wyatt Earp. Secondly, Wyatt Earp was still alive and completely uninvolved in any altercations with James Kennedy. While a shooting did occur at Sand Creek, Colorado, in 1880, involving a man named James Kennedy, it is established that the deceased individual was Warren Rockwood and James Kennedy had acted in self-defense. As to whether this James Kennedy was the same individual who killed Dora Hahn in Dodge City, the available information does not provide conclusive evidence to warrant a comprehensive analysis. The residents of Dodge City were skeptical of the claim that Wyatt Earp had met his demise. The Dodge City Times dismissed the report, stating, The above statement is not believed in Dodge City. Earp is engaged as a special messenger by Wells Fargo and Company on a division of the railroad in New Mexico. While the story appeared to be fabricated, the article proceeded to make yet another error. It asserted, Earp was never engaged in a conflict with Kennedy. The latter was shot in the shoulder by a posse of officers during a pursuit. Earp was not among them. This discrepancy is amusing because it directly contradicts a prior article published by the same newspaper, the Dodge City Times, which had previously stated that Wyatt Earp was indeed a member of the posse. The consensus widely acknowledges Earp's presence. In the aftermath of James Kennedy's apprehension, the Dodge City Times, in an attempt to rectify the previous erroneous report, offered an explanation that inadvertently contradicted its own account from two years prior. Advice to a Cousin In addition to his renowned brothers, Wyatt Earp had a first cousin who also found himself in Kansas during the tumultuous era of the Wild West. This cousin, George Washington Earp, was the son of Jonathan Douglas Earp, who happened to be Wyatt Earp's uncle. Despite the familial connection, Wyatt was 15 years older than George, creating a dynamic where George naturally looked up to his older cousin. While some of the tales recounted by George Earp may stray from historical accuracy, there is one anecdote that holds a ring of believability. As the story goes, upon George's arrival in Dodge City, Wyatt harbored reservations about his cousin treading the path of a lawman, deeming the rough and tumble nature of Dodge City unsuitable for his younger relative. Consequently, Wyatt made the decision to redirect George to nearby Garden City, where he found employment as a cowboy. Remaining in Kansas, George Earp eventually found himself involved in the founding of Ulysses, Kansas, in 1885. Displaying entrepreneurial spirit, George played a pivotal role in the town's development, undertaking the task of surveying its site and actively promoting its growth. Moreover, he assumed the role of its inaugural peace officer. His name lived on. 
Despite Wyatt Earp and his wife Josephine never having children of their own, the legacy of the Earp name found a way to persist within the family lineage. It was Wyatt's half-brother, Newton, who ensured that the name endured by naming his two sons after his brothers. Thus, Wyatt and Virgil were immortalized as the namesakes of Newton's offspring. However, in common practice, the sons often went by their first and middle names, Wyatt Clyde and Virgil Edwin. Throughout his life, Wyatt Clyde opted to shed his first name and embraced the simplicity of being known solely as Clyde. This choice could have been motivated by a desire to evade the shadows cast by his infamous uncle or simply to carve out his own identity. Nevertheless, when Wyatt Clyde's journey came to an end in 1937 at the age of 64, his departure from this world garnered attention. In an obituary published in The Sacramento Bee, he was referred to as Kin, a famous gunman is dead, a testament to the enduring influence of the Earp name and its association with the storied history of the Wild West. Wyatt Earp Set Sail Wyatt Earp's influence extended far beyond the boundaries of the American West, capturing the admiration of individuals from diverse backgrounds and pursuits. Among his many admirers, was the intrepid American explorer Lincoln Ellsworth, whose endeavors took him to the remote expanses of the Antarctic. Ellsworth, driven by a quest to chart new territories and acquire invaluable insights, embarked on multiple expeditions to this frozen frontier. In a bold display of innovation and determination, Ellsworth repurposed a wooden fishing vessel originally constructed in 1919 transforming it into a formidable vessel capable of navigating the treacherous Antarctic terrain, he fortified the ship by encasing it in a three-quarter-inch steel armor plate. However, it was not merely the vessel's physical attributes that distinguished it, but the name bestowed upon it, the Wyatt Earp. In his book Beyond Horizons, Ellsworth eloquently expressed his admiration, declaring, This vessel I christened Wyatt Earp, after the famous frontier marshal of the West. It was a gesture imbued with reverence and homage, symbolizing Ellsworth's desire to infuse his expedition with the indomitable spirit of Wyatt Earp. Unflattering depiction. Despite the multitude of photographs capturing Wyatt Earp's visage, his likeness has been immortalized in various sketches throughout the years, often gracing the pages of newspaper articles dedicated to his life and exploits. However, among these depictions, one stands out as particularly unflattering, a cartoon published in the New York Herald and later reprinted in the San Francisco Call on December 12, 1896, titled The Bad Man Referee. Following closely behind is another uncomplimentary portrayal featured in the San Francisco Call on December 8, 1896, under the title On the Road to Arizona. But why did such animosity towards Wyatt Earp surface in 1896? The catalyst for this disdain can be traced back to December 2nd of that year, when Earp assumed the role of referee for a heavyweight boxing match between Bob Fitzsimmons and Tom Sharkey. As the match progressed into its eighth round, Fitzsimmons appeared to dominate the ring, poised as the clear victor. However, amidst the fervor of the bout, a pivotal moment ensued. A decisive blow delivered by Fitzsimmons to Sharkey prompted Earp to intervene, calling foul and declaring Sharkey the winner. Earp's controversial decision sent shockwaves through the boxing community, igniting accusations of foul play and corruption. Many speculated that Earp's judgment had been compromised, alleging that he may have been influenced by bribes or personal wagers placed on Sharkey's success. Adding fuel to the fire, Suspicions were further fueled by an incident preceding the match, wherein a vigilant police captain disarmed Earp of a Colt's Navy revolver concealed within his coat pocket. In the aftermath of the match, the caricatured portrayal of Earp in the aforementioned cartoons vividly encapsulates the public's perception of the events. Depicted wielding a pistol and depicted as foul Earp, he is shown favoring Sharkey over Fitzsimmons, symbolizing the alleged bias and misconduct attributed to Earp during the match. Even to this day, historians engaged in the study of Wyatt Earp's life and legacy
continue to debate the veracity of the events surrounding the contentious boxing match of 1896, a small role on the big screen. The earliest cinematic portrayal of Wyatt Earp wasn't the focus of the film itself, but rather a supporting role in the story of the famed gunfighter, Wild Bill Hickok. Renowned movie star William S. Hart took on the lead role in Wild Bill Hickok in 1923. Notably, Hart shared a friendship with both Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson, both of whom were depicted in the film. To embody the character of Wyatt Earp, the role was entrusted to Burt Lindley, known for his appearances in minor roles across various Western movies. Set against the backdrop of Dodge City, the film revolves around Wild Bill Hickok's collaboration with the Dodge City Peace Commission to restore law and order to the bustling cow town. While the exact fate of the film is uncertain, it's widely believed to be lost to time. Despite this, historical accounts suggest that Wyatt Earp's character had limited screen time, serving more as a background figure than a central protagonist. Interestingly, at the time of the film's premiere, both Wyatt Earp and his wife Josephine were still alive. Josephine herself expressed her delight in the cinematic portrayal, recounting in a letter to William S. Hart how she attended multiple screenings with friends, each time witnessing a packet house. She fondly recalled the enthusiastic applause that greeted Hart's appearance on screen, Indian Scare. The 1964 film Cheyenne Autumn offers a cinematic portrayal of the northern Cheyenne Exodus, also known as Dull Knife's Raid, which saw approximately 300 members of the northern Cheyenne tribe leaving the reservation in the Indian Territory to head back north. In one particular scene of the movie, Wyatt Earp, portrayed by James Stewart, finds himself facing the panicked citizens of Dodge City as rumors swirl that Cheyenne Indians are nearing the town. Historically, when the Cheyenne did pass through Kansas in September of 1878, Wyatt Earp held the position of peace officer in Dodge City. During this time, he found himself having to manage the apprehension and anxiety of the townsfolk. As recounted in the Dodge City Times on September the 21st, 1878, reports of Cheyenne's murder and thievery from the surrounding plains threw the people of Dodge City into a state of great agitation. The situation escalated when word spread that the Indians had been spotted within close proximity to the city. The sounding of the fire bell at two o'clock only served to heighten the tension, prompting the assembly of citizens at the engine house. Calls for arms were made to the governor, leading to the readiness of pistols and guns throughout Dodge City. Amidst the chaos, flames were spotted emanating from the house of Harrisonbury, situated on an island four miles west of the city. Suspicions arose that the Indians might have set the fire, intensifying the fear gripping the community. A locomotive, carrying concerned citizens, rushed to the scene of the conflagration managing to prevent the fiery elements from engulfing haystacks and livestock. Noteworthy figures like P.L. Betty, Chuck Beeson, Wyatt Earp, and S.C. Isaacson played pivotal roles in extinguishing the flames, showcasing the collective effort to protect the town from disaster. Despite the initial alarm, it was later speculated that the fire might have originated from a stove left unattended by fleeing families. Wyatt made money in gambling and mining after losing his job as deputy. When Wyatt Earp arrived in Tombstone, he was accompanied by Maddie Blaylock, who was referred to as Wyatt's wife and widely believed to be his common-law spouse. Maddie suffered from severe headaches and relied on laudanum, an over-the-counter medication containing opiates and alcohol, which was highly addictive and easily accessible. With Maddie often incapacitated due to her health issues, Wyatt formed a relationship with Sadie Marcus. It's speculated that Sadie may have worked as a prostitute under Behan's employment before Wyatt's arrival in Tombstone. Both Behan and Earp had offices situated above the Crystal Palace Saloon in Tombstone, and their shared interest in Sadie exacerbated the already strained relationship between them. Despite later claims by some of his defenders, including Sadie Marcus, that Wyatt never profited from gambling or the prostitution business, evidence suggests otherwise, especially after he left the sheriff's office. 
gambling was considered a legitimate, albeit not entirely respectable, profession, and Wyatt was known to operate faro tables. In fact, he even invited his friend Bat Masterson to Tombstone to work for him in running table games, which Masterson did until he returned to Dodge City in the spring of 1881. There is no concrete evidence to suggest that Wyatt engaged in cheating. Understanding that the odds typically favored the house, he had little incentive to resort to such tactics. He was arrested for murder after the gunfight at O.K. Corral. After arriving in the bustling, silver-mining town of Tombstone, Arizona, in 1879, Wyatt Earp soon found himself occasionally employed as a law officer, drawn by the promise of work amidst the town's booming industry. It was in Tombstone that one of the most infamous incidents of the Wild West unfolded, the legendary gunfight at the O.K. Corral. On the fateful afternoon of October 26, 1881, tensions reached a boiling point as Earp and his brothers, Morgan and Virgil, along with their compatriot Doc Holliday, confronted the notorious cattle-thieving brothers, Billy and Ike Clanton, and the McClory brothers, Frank and Tom, in a lot behind the O.K. Corral. Virgil Earp, acting in his capacity as a lawman, demanded the cowboys surrender their firearms, seeking to defuse the escalating confrontation. However, instead of compliance, gunfire erupted, shattering the tense silence of the lot. The exact sequence of events remains a subject of debate, with uncertainty clouding who fired the first shot. The shootout, brief but intense, claimed the lives of three individuals, Frank and Tom McClory and Billy Clanton. In the aftermath of the deadly confrontation, the Earps and Holiday found themselves in legal jeopardy, arrested and charged with murder. Yet, in late November 1881, they were acquitted in court, vindicated of the charges against them. However, the respite was short-lived as tragedy struck again a month later. In a brazen ambush outside a tombstone saloon, gunmen targeted Virgil Earp, inflicting severe injuries to his arm. Though he survived the attack, the incident marked yet another blow to the Earp family. In response, Wyatt, now serving as a deputy U.S. Marshal, took decisive action, organizing a posse to pursue the perpetrators. Subsequently, in March 1882, tragedy struck the Earp family once more when Morgan Earp fell victim to a cowardly assassination while in the company of Wyatt at a tombstone pool hall. Driven by grief and a thirst for vengeance, Wyatt and his posse embarked on a mission of retribution, targeting several members of the cowboy faction believed to be responsible for Morgan's death. However, the retaliatory killings cast a shadow over Wyatt's legacy in Tombstone, tarnishing his reputation in the eyes of many. Faced with mounting hostility and the lingering specter of violence, Wyatt Earp eventually made the difficult decision to flee Tombstoney, leaving behind a town steeped in bloodshed and controversy. Earp refereed a controversial championship boxing match. Following his departure from Tombstone in 1882, Wyatt Earp embarked on a transient lifestyle, wandering across the expanses of the American West while keeping a low profile and relying on his gambling skills to make ends meet. By the late 1880s, he found himself settled in the coastal city of San Diego, California, accompanied by his partner, Josephine Marcus, an actress hailing from New York City, whom he had encountered during his time in Tombstone. In San Diego, Earp immersed himself in various endeavors, diversifying his sources of income beyond gambling. One notable pursuit was his involvement in the world of horse racing, where he applied his expertise to train racehorses, demonstrating a keen eye for talent and an understanding of the intricacies of the sport. Additionally, Earp ventured into the realm of prize fighting, taking on roles as an organizer and promoter of boxing matches, leveraging his connections and reputation to draw crowds and generate excitement around the events. A pivotal moment in Earp's involvement in the sporting world occurred on December 2, 1896 when he assumed the role of referee for a high-stakes heavyweight championship bout between renowned pugilists Bob Fitzsimmons and Tom Sharkey. The match was held in the bustling city of San Francisco and attended by a throng of approximately 10,000 spectators. As the bout progressed, Fitzsimmons asserted his dominance in the ring, 
seemingly on the brink of securing victory as he unleashed a powerful blow that sent Sharky tumbling to the canvas. However, the tide of the fight shifted dramatically when Earp, in a controversial decision, deemed Fitzsimmons's punch to be illegal, prompting him to disqualify the seasoned fighter. The contentious ruling sparked outrage among boxing enthusiasts with whispers of corruption and manipulation, casting a shadow over the integrity of the match. In the aftermath of the scandal, Fitzsimmons initiated legal proceedings against Sharkey, alleging foul play and seeking recourse for what he perceived as an unjust outcome. Despite the fervent protests of innocence from Earp, who maintained that he had acted impartially and in accordance with the rules, Earp was the last surviving participant of the OK Corral shootout. Following a life marked by frontier adventures and brushes with notoriety, Wyatt Earp breathed his last at his residence in Los Angeles on January 13, 1929, at the age of 80. While the exact cause of his demise remains subject to speculation, it is believed that chronic cystitis may have contributed to his passing. Earp's longtime companion, Josephine Marcus, who had affectionately taken on the name Josephine Earp, despite the absence of official records confirming their marriage, oversaw the arrangements for his final resting place. In accordance with his wishes, Earp's remains were cremated and interred at a cemetery in Colma, California, a peaceful enclave where he would find eternal repose. As fate would have it, Earp's departure marked the end of an era as he stood as the last surviving participant of the infamous gunfight at the OK Corral, a defining moment in his storied life. In his twilight years, Earp transitioned into a role as a consultant for Hollywood westerns, lending his expertise and first-hand experiences to ensure the authenticity of cinematic portrayals of the Wild West. Through this endeavor, he forged connections with esteemed actors and directors, cementing his legacy as a pivotal figure in the American cultural landscape. Earp's funeral, a solemn affair befitting his stature, drew luminaries from the world of entertainment and beyond. Among the distinguished attendees was Western film star Tom Mix, who honored Earp's memory by serving as a pallbearer, paying homage to the legendary lawman whose exploits had captivated the imaginations of generations. In the wake of his passing, Wyatt Earp's legacy underwent a transformation, propelled by the publication of a best-selling biography in 1931 titled Wyatt Earp, Frontier Marshal, penned by Stuart Lake. While the biography undoubtedly captured the essence of Earp's larger-than-life persona, it also veered into the realm of embellishment, embellishing certain aspects of his life and adventures. Nevertheless, the book served as a catalyst for a wave of cinematic adaptations, with Hollywood embracing Earp's narrative as that of a heroic lawman, portrayed by a succession of esteemed actors ranging from Henry Fonda to James Garner to Kevin Costner, each adding their own unique interpretation to the enduring legend of Wyatt Earp survived by a younger sister. One of Wyatt Earp's siblings outlived him, his younger sister, Adelia Douglas Earp. In addition to Adelia, Wyatt had three sisters in total. His half-sister, Mariah Ann, tragically passed away at the tender age of eight months in 1839. Another sister, Martha Elizabeth, was older than Wyatt, born in 1845, but sadly, she succumbed to death at the age of 10 in 1856. Adelia Douglas, born in 1861, lived a much longer life than her siblings. She reached the age of 79 before passing away on January 16, 1941, due to pneumonia. Adelia tied the knot with William Edwards, and together they had four daughters and two sons. Interestingly, one of their sons was named Virgil, perhaps as a tribute to Wyatt's brother. Adelia found her final resting place at Mount View Cemetery in San Bernardino, where she lies next to her husband and her brother James. It's worth noting that the ashes of Virgil's wife, Allie, were also interred with Adelia, further uniting the family even in death. What's in a name? You might be familiar with the well-known film 
Frontier Marshal from 1939, featuring Randolph Scott portraying Wyatt Earp and Cesar Romero as Doc Holliday. Interestingly, this movie is actually a remake of the 1934 film with the same title. Unfortunately, the 1934 version is believed to be lost to time. In the earlier film, George O'Brien takes on the lead role, but it's worth noting that the character isn't named Wyatt Earp. Instead, he goes by Michael Wyatt. Now, why did the name change to Michael Wyatt? Well, it stems from a legal concern involving Wyatt Earp's wife, Josephine, who was still alive at the time. She objected to the portrayal of her late husband in the unauthorized film threatening legal action against 20th Century Fox. As a result, the film's title was altered from Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshal to simply Frontier Marshal, and the protagonist's name was adjusted accordingly. Despite the change, the film still drew heavily from Wyatt Earp's life, with one article noting that the screenplay was adapted from incidents in his life. Josephine's persistence in defending Wyatt's legacy extended to the 1939 remake starring Randolph Scott. Although she initially planned to sue the studio, director Alan Dwan managed to dissuade her with his persuasive charm during a personal meeting. This decision spared the later production from legal scrutiny. Interestingly, the 1934 film wasn't the first to draw inspiration from Wyatt Earp's life. That distinction belongs to the 1932 film Law and Order, where the main character's name is Frame Johnson instead of Wyatt Earp, yet the plot closely mirrors events from Earp's life. The life of Wyatt Earp is a complex tapestry woven with tales of frontier justice, gambling, and adventure. As we delve deeper into the annals of history, we uncover both the heroics and controversies surrounding this iconic figure of the Wild West. What are your thoughts on Wyatt Earp's legacy? Leave your comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe for more captivating content. See you next time.